Well, good morning. Welcome to Train Baptist Temple. Thank you so much for being here. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, just a reminder for all you youth parents, this Tuesday night we have our Bible study uh, for all youth. It's at uh, me and Ashley's house, and so hopefully all the kids can be coming. We've, we've had a couple of uh, great first lessons there. Whenever you start something new, you never know how it's going to go with those teenagers especially, but we've had about 25 kids out at our house the past two months, and uh, we're excited uh, about this study, talking about how they should... Um, handle relationships rightly, especially with uh, people of the opposite sex, and so uh, it's been a great study thus far. And then on Wednesday, we have church service, of course, at 7, and then on Thursday, we have outreach, and please come and be a part of our five-mile mission. We're going out trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so if you've never been there, been a part, come. We have child care, food provided, everything you need, uh, just come, and we'll partner you up with someone, and you can go out and uh, see what it's like to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning I'll read a, a set of scripture in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 37. It says, And when he came nigh, even now, into the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the almighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto them, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the, the example of these apostles, these prophets, these that were there who were, who were just praising you in your name. And uh, God, I can't imagine what it would be like uh, there uh, that morning or that day praising you like that. But uh, there were a few who said that that's not the way it should be. God, we know that that still takes place here in, 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 uh, in our, 2,000 years later in, in our day, Lord. People saying, no, you shouldn't be crying out to that Jesus. But God, I pray this morning that we would pour out ourselves to you, that we'd pour out our voices to you, and that they would be a sweet swelling savor to you. God, just bless now as we stand and sing. Bless the remainder of this service, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning.
right. Praise the Lord. Once again, welcome this morning to Train Baptist Temple. If you're a guest visiting with us, we just want to give you an extra special welcome. Say thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning. If you need anything, please see one of these guys in the gray jackets or right out front. There's a welcome center. Someone will be out there to answer any questions. Maybe meet any needs you might have this morning. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord. And now as we enter into this time to, to give back to you, Lord, I, I pray that... Uh, uh, you would take this offering and you would use it in a mighty way. 
God, our uh, lives should be given to the gospel, should be devoted to uh, getting the gospel out more and more. And God, I, I pray that through what's taken up here in this offering, that we would be able to do that through this church and through the people of this church, God. Just use these funds to go and, and share the gospel with the ends of the earth. God, we love you and we thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to give back to you. I pray that you would bless the remainder of this service again. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
next day, the great crowd that had gathered heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This crowd praised him. They celebrated his miracles and with great expectation told everyone about him. But they did not know him. They were waiting for someone who would rule with strength and might. But he came as a humble servant. They wanted him to finally bring their people glory but he wanted to change them so their lives would bring God glory. They were expecting a general who would crush their enemies, but he came saying, love your enemies. They thought he could offer them deliverance from their oppressors, but he came offering deliverance from sin. This crowd would soon realize that Jesus wasn't gonna be what they wanted, and they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. So as they yelled, crucify, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus answered, I am not that kind of king. His kingdom isn't what you see here. It won't be established by chaos and war. His kingdom is in our hearts. His kingdom is truth. His kingdom is goodness. His kingdom is righteousness. He is the humble king, the king of healing, the king of forgiveness, the king of love. Today, we lift our voices. We cry, Hosanna, save us. Save us from our sin. Come dwell in our hearts. Hosanna, we worship you. Jesus Christ, our king.
sing a prodigal return. Amen. <laughs> it's good to see y'all here this morning. Man, praise the Lord for the weather. Oh, man, this past week was, was good. Well, as Brother Jeffrey said, a lot of stuff going on. Please be uh, looking in your bulletins. One of the things specifically I want to remind you about is our services next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday uh, celebration. We've been celebrating the resurrection all month long, but... Uh, again, it's uh, what we refer to as Easter, but it's, it's the resurrection celebration. And so we have special things going on that morning in your bulletin. You'll find all the times that are going on. So early, early in the morning, I think 645, we're starting out uh, doing some uh, sunrise prayer and devotion, and then we'll do breakfast right after. So breakfast is provided. You're, you're welcome to come and join us. Uh, there'll be coffee and, and breakfast. And then at 9, we'll have the Lord's Supper. And we do it uh, uniquely here, kind of set out tables and stuff. So I uh, want to invite you to that. If you are uh, born again and, and been baptized, we invite you to come be a part of that. 
And then um, the service starts at 1050 as usual. There's no Sunday school and there's no PM service um, next Sunday. So again, a lot of stuff going on early in the morning and then the, the evening there to spend with your, your family. So if you have your Bibles and ask you to turn real quick to Luke chapter 21 and uh, I'm going to pray right off the bat and we're going to jump in this because we've got a lot of scripture I'm going to try to read and get through uh, so that we can uh, be at the resurrection for next Sunday. So that's kind of how we're going to go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you again for the opportunity we have to worship you. Lord, as uh, we saw in the, in the video just a little bit ago, you are our king. You are the only king. You're the king of kings. And we're so thankful that we can have a relationship with you. So thankful that we can talk to you right now. Um, Lord, we know that we are undeserving, that we are sinners and God, it's only by the blood, it's only through what you've done for us that we can call on your name 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single day of the year. We realize that it's only because of the blood, it's only because of the death and the resurrection that we can have this relationship with you. And so we're so grateful for it, so thankful uh, for you being our God, for you being our King, for you also bring, being our Father. Lord, thank you for being such a loving Father that teaches us and instructs us and corrects us and um, Lord, we, we thank you for all these things, and we thank you for this time that we get to spend in your word again. Uh, now that we've, we've worshiped you and, and we've been blessed with the singing, and uh, Lord, we, we pray now that your spirit would move in, in, in this message and, and through your word, that our hearts would be ready, that our minds would be ready uh, to receive this message and to receive your words and to, to respond to it, God. Help us to respond rightly to your word. Um, Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's not saved, they've never given their life to you, They've never trusted Jesus. They've never experienced the power of, of, of salvation, the power of the resurrection. Um, Lord, I ask that you would just move in their life and their heart today uh, so that they would be born again. And we'll praise you for all these things, God. We ask them all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is just a little extra. The last sermon I didn't get to finish up, but I wanted to, to move forward. So I'm going to give it to you. Point number three in your notes that you see there is the careful preparations for the end of the end of time. So I just want to re re remember where we're at in our study uh, to, to kind of go where, to get where we're going, um, and that's this. Jesus is getting close to the end of his life, his earthly ministry, and he's been preparing his followers, those who have left everything to follow him, on what it's going to look like once he leaves for them following him. So this is, this is what you're going to have to go through. If you can continue to follow me, you're going to have to deal with this in the world. Again, we saw the nature of the persecution we saw what persecution looks like today in 2018. Um, and so Jesus giving these preparations for his followers. Now here's the truth. As I said last week, you and I would want the same exact thing and we have the same exact thing. We have 2,000 years closer to what Jesus was telling his followers. This is what you need to be prepared for. This is how you need to live your life. This is the things that are gonna come upon you in your life. And so in chapter 21, verse 29, he says this. As he spake unto them a parable, behold the fig tree. Look at this fig tree over here, Jesus said. And all the trees. He said, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. Again, we're, we're at that time of year right now. Uh, what was once dead in the, in the winter is starting to bud in spring. What's going to happen here pretty soon is it's going to start producing fruit. And we're going to start seeing uh, different fruits show up on trees and stuff like that. And Jesus was using the illustration of his own creation to drive home this point. You can look at the trees, you can look at this fig tree, and you can know that it's about to, to produce fruit, and it's about to be its time of harvest. He says, so likewise ye, when you see these things that he just told his disciples about come to pass, you know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Just as you know the fruit's coming, you see the, 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 the blossoms happening, you know the fruit's coming, just as you see that, you know that when you see these things, wars and rumors of war and all this stuff coming about, you know that the kingdom of God is near, just like the fruit is near. He goes on to say this, Verily, so truly, listen to me, he says, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, this is something amazing because Jesus, his teaching and his tone to the people here was for a purpose, I believe, very important purpose. And here it is. They were to live in constant expectation. The word that we use today is hope. 
But the, it's translated as constant expectations. And when we say I hope in something, it's not some wishful thinking or hoping like, like we think. It is a constant or, or, or an absolute expectation for something to come. And so when we say this is Jesus given these words for this reason, for us to live in constant anticipation for his return. I've asked this question many times before, is that how we're living? If we look at our life, do I live every day like Jesus could come back today? Do I live my life like, is this what I want to be doing when my Lord comes back? The one, you know, the one that, that, that went through all the beating and the death to give me eternal life. Is this what I want to be doing when he returns? So we're to live in constant expectation. Again, yes, a lot of the state of the heart, but man, what are we going to be doing? How are we going to be living? Where is your life at right now? Where is your heart at right now? in light of the soon coming of our Lord. Paul called the, the blessed hope in Titus chapter two, verse 13. He would also write to, to Timothy a little later, and he would say this about the return of God, that there's this crown of righteousness that's waiting for him. And it's not just reserved for Paul only, but it's for everyone who lives in, or loves the appearing of the Lord, lives in this constant expectation, this anticipation of Christ's return. But if you look back in our text, there was this, this indicator, this, this, this thing that is so important for so many people, and people have, have debated over this, and theologians have had, con there's been controversy after controversy, and, and people have tried to put this analogy on it and, 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 and describe it and explain it away. And here, here, here's the, 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 the statement where he said, Truly, I say unto you that this generation shall not, be, shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Again, a lot of controversy has swirled around this. But here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus was telling them that this generation that will see these cosmetological events, these, these cosmological events, I'm sorry, these things, things that are going on in the, in, the, in the heavens and the skies and the wonders, those people will still be alive when the kingdom comes to earth. Jesus reiterates the importance of this, anticip uh, this anticipatory living, living in constant expectation of God's return in the next verse, in verse 34. So he says, so take heed to yourselves. Pay attention to how you live your lives, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that a day come upon you unawares. And he says this, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Again, God had revealed the mystery of the end time to a couple of primary apostles. I mean, Peter had some, but according to the, 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 the word that we have written down for us, to the apostle Paul and to the apostle John. John in, Revelation, uh, in, in the revelation of Jesus, and of course, Paul throughout all of his letters. But to the Ephesians, Paul wrote this. In chapter 5, he says this, See then that you walk circumspectly. Walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil. Again, he's saying, look, 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, the apostle Paul is writing to the church uh, uh, in, in Ephesus and saying, look, you know that the times are evil. You know that things are bad. You know that Jesus is coming back soon. So make sure that you live your life in, in, in careful anticipation of the Lord's return. Now, I wonder today what, what people have thought throughout the generations. You know, I mean, Paul was saying he's coming back soon. He hasn't come yet to the Thessalonian believers but he's coming back soon, and generation after generation after generation has come and passed, and Jesus hadn't come back. You have people today saying, look, people, Christians have been saying all the time, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Jesus is coming back today, Jesus is coming back anytime. But that was the point of Jesus' teaching, and that was the point of his giving his disciples even then, this warning and this teaching about how the end is gonna come about. It's gonna come about in a way that's gonna be fast and sudden going to catch the world like a snare, he said. The Thessalonian church, he, he, I'm going to read some verses here. In chapter 5, he says this in, in, in the first book. He says, but of the times and season, brethren, uh, you have no need that I write. You, you know how things go. Just as Jesus said, look at the fig tree. You know how it all works. I don't have to tell you what's going to happen in spring and summer. You know, it, Paul's saying the same thing. You don't need, need me to write that because he says this. You know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes at the thief of the night, just as Jesus taught. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
You know, I, I've, praise God, never experienced birth pains. That may be a shocker, but I, I've, never, uh, I've never experienced anything like that before. Uh, but my wife has, Rochelle has, and um, the first child was interesting, Avery, because we were in the hospital for a really long time, and they gave her a couple different drugs. One, one was to make her relaxed and, and then an, an epidural. And the first drug, I thought, when they were saying it was going to her, make her relax, I thought, man, she didn't feel no pain. Because, I mean, in the room, I'm sitting there, and she's out cold, holding on to the side of the rail, out cold. And every time that she would have a contraction, I would see it coming on the monitor, you know. And then she would she'd start breathing, but she pretty much stayed asleep the whole time, so I thought. Well, later on, she told me, oh, I felt it. I was, I was feeling the pains and stuff. With Addison, it was a little bit different. She, they didn't get her the medicine in time, and she was feeling full-fledged birth pains before they got any medicine inside of her. And, uh, you know, but I, I don't know what that's like, but I remember walking around the, the maternity unit. They were not going to keep her for sure, for sure uh, but she was in pain. And I kept telling the nurse, we're not going home. She, <laughs> I mean, look, look she's, she's hurting like really, really bad. We'd be walking around, and she'd stop, and she'd like, oh, you know, I mean, cramping over and stuff, and, and it was just a mess. I've never experienced that other than with her, and, you know, of course, family and, and, and stuff like that, but um, I just, I, you, you know that it's coming real soon because you have those, what are they, Braxton Hicks, you know, and, and, and they can seem like they're real, but when the real thing comes, all you women who have had children, you know it's a different deal. Well, that's, that's what I believe that, that Jesus and the Apostle Paul was even teaching. He, he was saying, look, when it gets to the end, you will know. And that's why I think so many of us as Christians, there's something different. Yeah, yes, generation after generation have said, yes, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. But we look at our world today and we look at what's going on and look at what's happening in the skies and looking all over and we say, it is like a woman that, that is about to give birth. That's what it seems like. So again, he says, brethren, you're not in darkness. That should overtake you as a thief. He's talking to the church. Look, the day of the Lord is not going to take you as, as children who are living for the Lord, children who have been saved, children of God who are in the, in, in the, in the light, children of the day. It's not going to come upon you and take you like a, a thief it comes into a house at night. It's not going to happen to you like that because you'll be ready. You'll be living in anticipation. You'll be praying. You'll be watching. You'll be living. It's not going to happen to you like that. He says, because you're all the children of the light, children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Let it, uh, therefore, let us not sleep as, others do, as do others, but let us watch. Let's stay alert and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober and putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope. There's that word, hope. The hope of salvation, this confident expectation of deliverance. Let's put it on that mind, regardless of what happens, knowing that we're going to be with the Lord when he returns. For God has not appointed us to wrath, we're not destined for wrath, but to obtain salvation, deliverance, by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we live and breathe on this earth, or whether our bodies are put in a coffin, we should live together with him. But look what Paul wrote again. Let us watch and be sober. Let's stay alert and sleepless. Let's stay like a night watchman, and let's be self-controlled in our lives because Jesus is coming back soon. That's, that's, what, that's what the teaching was. Again, Jesus is preparing all of his followers for his soon return 2,000 years ago. Here we are 2,000 years later, and his return is that much closer. How much more should we be living in anticipation of God's return? How much more? And again, it, it breaks my heart. I was talking to a pastor this last week that's a pastor out in Rome, and, and we were sharing. We had a board meeting. We were sharing and talking about different things, and and I was just kind of sharing some of my heart, and he, he about come across the table and said, you, you're sharing my heart. Then I said, you know, it just, it just blows my mind that today in 2018, we say the Lord's coming back, but it is like we are struggling to get people in the church to be committed to the church. I, I, I'm thinking it just blows my mind. And he said, it is. He goes, it's the, it's the craziest thing. I said, we, I said, we live in a world in a day and time where the world says, hey, we're going to do this on a day the church has set aside for, for centuries and, 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 and thousands of years to worship their God. 
uh, as a body. And the world comes along and says, hey, we're going to have these events on this day. And the church says, okay, no problem. We'll do that too. It, it, and, and, and we're like this much closer to the Lord's return. Christians and us, we, we, the church, we should be way more committed than before. We're, that's what Jesus is teaching. Look, it's going to get closer. It's the, 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 my return. And so you need to be sleepless and alert and sober and, and, and have a control over yourself and, and be committed to me. Now look at his words in verse 36. Again, this is what Jesus said. Watch you therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come, up, that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Oh, what is he saying here exactly? He's saying this. Stay awake at all times, spiritually awake at all times. Don't, don't spiritually slumber. Don't, don't take your eyes off of me. But pray that you'd have strength to escape all the things that are going to take place. Remember, talking to his disciples then, that eventually would be, be pretty much most of them be martyred. But they would be imprisoned. They would be beaten. They'd be stoned. They would, they would be persecuted, just as he would say. And again, up to today, still being persecuted all over the world. He said, pray that you're going to have strength to escape these things. And to stand before the Son of Man and that he would be pleased with your life. So I think that we kind of ride this, this hope of grace, which grace is real and mercy is real, but this, this, this wave of abusing grace. Well, well God, God loves me. God's going to understand. And as long as I make it to heaven and stand before him, everything's going to be okay. That's not the mindset that Jesus taught. Jesus taught to live your life in anticipation in a way that whether you live or die, just as the Apostle Paul said, that God would be glorified in your life. And that's how we should be living. Look, if I live or I die, I want him to be glorified in my life. I don't want to just live however I want to live and then stand before him and say, yeah, I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead. I'm going to heaven. I got my ticket. That's not how he said live. He said, follow me. And if it costs you even your life, if you have to go through persecution, if you have to lose everything in this world, I want you to still follow me. Live a life like that. And that type of life of complete surrender is a life that's worthy of your Lord. That's what Jesus said, that you may be counted worthy to stand before him. Unashamed. This, this persecution, this chaos at the end of this world that we're starting to see and that we have been seeing in our life. He says, keep praying. Don't just keep praying, but keep enduring the path of obedience. Keep, keep pressing down the path of obedience so that when you do stand before your king, you stand before him unashamed. Now we move on to verse 37. It says, in the day and, uh, and in the daytime he was teaching the temple, night he went out to the, the Mount of Olives. And it says that all the people came and, and, and wanted to hear him teach in the temple. The next day in chapter 22, it goes on to say, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh which is called Passover, the Passover. And chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. They, they, they didn't want to just go up and say, look, this guy's causing a problem, let's just get rid of him. They didn't want to do that because they feared the people. The people were giving them their power. The people were giving them their esteem that they were feeling. We can't just go in here and take this guy. We'll, we'll, we'll be in trouble. So they had to conspire against Jesus. Look what happens in verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Which has always been such an interesting thing, right? This is just this is a side note. This is not even, always an interesting thing. Jesus, knowing from beginning of before there was ever time, that all of these events would take place, knowing that Judas would betray him, knowing all these things, Jesus still chose Judas to be a part of his twelve. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And, and, and some people say, well, why did he do that? I, mean, I think there's several different, according to Scripture, uh, 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 principles that we could grab and we could say, this is maybe why Jesus still chose Judas even though he knew he would betray him. Maybe as an example of the kind of grace that God offers to everybody. Maybe of the, the, the sacrifice that's avail available for all. There's several, several different ways. Maybe as a lesson to followers of Jesus Christ for, for even us 2,000 years later that, would, that we would realize that sometimes everybody that's showing up to gather isn't necessarily there for the right reason. 
or he isn't even isn't a part of his family. Several different things that we can learn from this, but this verse tells us along with John chapter 13 and verse 27, along with other verses, that it is possible for people to know who Jesus is. To gather with other people who actually walk with Jesus and believe in Jesus. And yet still not possess or be possessed with Jesus. Scripture tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That he cannot have any, that the light has no fellowship with darkness at all. Period. That's why his abode cannot be shared with Satan's abode. In other words, we are vessels, we are, we are souls, and our souls cannot be possessed by God and be possessed by Satan, be possessed by Satan and be possessed by God. It's one or the other, period. So why are you saying this? Because one of the things is, is assurance. If you're God's, if you're 100%, one, no doubt in your mind, you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you, you have placed all of your faith, what does that, what does that look, look like? That looks like at one point in time, you were controlling your life, your decisions were driving everything you did, and at some point you let go because you trusted Jesus. And you said, the control of my life is now in your hands, not in my hands anymore. And the reason I trust you is because I know that you're a son of God. I know that you came to this earth. You died on the cross for my sins. I know that they put you in a grave, but you rose again the third day. And there's no other way to heaven except for through you. And so you have my life. You, you tell me what to do, and I'll follow. That's what, that's what faith, salvation looks like. It's not a prayer. It's not a head knowledge. It's not knowing all the events that took place in Jesus' life and thinking that that's what gets you to heaven. It's not. It's an absolute surrender. That's what Jesus taught. That's what, that's what Scripture tells us. So again, I don't think anybody had to convince that Jesus was who he was to Judas. Judas knew. Judas saw all the miracles. Judas heard all the words. He saw the power and the presence there. Judas had all of that, those knowledge, just exactly what the Bible tells us in James where it says this, that the demons believe and they tremble. They know all of the things about Jesus. They, they, the, the demons have heard this for thousands of years and could probably quote scripture than, better than anybody else in this room. The, the demons probably have way more theology than we do. They've seen it. They've known it. They, they, they've been around it. But the demons aren't saved and going to heaven one day. It's just Judas wasn't. He, he knew. He saw. He was around. He was hanging out with the other 11. He was gathered at church services. But his heart wasn't surrendered. His life wasn't surrendered. I mean, it, maybe on the outside it kind of looked like every now and then it was. Well, Judas is always with him. He was hand-selected by Jesus. If you are truly God's, no doubt you've surrendered. John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29 tells us that there's no man that can pluck you out of the Father's hand. There's nothing or no one that can take you out of God's hand. There's nothing you can do. No one can pull you away. If you are surrendered, you are a child of God, you cannot be taken away from God. So Judas, at one point in time, was not Jesus's, and then Satan came in and stole him away from that. That's not how it was. I share this because I, as I was sharing with that pastor this past week, I'm so concerned that many churchgoers today, many professing, please listen to these words, professing Christ followers, but not possessors, are the same exact way. I believe that many people are professing that they're following Jesus Christ, but it's clearly that they only follow Jesus Christ in their convenience. How it works into their life, and I shared this last week as well, it only works for me if it fits into this day of the week or this time. It only works for me if it's like that. No, there's many people that are professing to follow Christ, but they're not. And I believe these same people would sell Jesus Christ out for money, and they do. I think they would sell Jesus Christ out for other earthly idols, sports, hobbies, possessions. 
happens on a weekly basis. Jesus getting sold out. Yet those same people still profess that they are his and he is theirs. And I'm not trying to say this from a place of perfection. I'm not at all. But if, 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 you, if, if there's competition in our life for the Lord of our life, the king of our life, if, there's, if our life, I mean, we can have it in our head, but if we can look in our life and be real and honest, is the course of my life truly following Jesus? Are there things that come across my life sometimes and that, that are a real competition for my allegiance? He's to be the undisputed king of our life, the very clear Lord over our life, not just some mythical person that we read about in Scripture, but the God who loves us and we walk with, just as Jesus was walking with his followers there. Judas, hearing, walking, experiencing, a part of, and we're about to see, a part of the Last Supper, the Passover. I mean, all these things. But he was possessed of the demon, of the devil. That's why I'm so concerned about the lack of commitment I mean, here, here's the truth. It, it, it's one day of, of, of seven that we gather here. Well, we, we have a, a midweek service too, in the middle of the week. But, but when it's hard for us to, to arrange our schedule, to be here, and so, well, I worship God in my own way, then, then you created something for yourself. Jesus set up his church. We just, we just said, we just saw that even before he left, he was going in, in in the mornings and teaching in the temple. And then he was going out and they were fellowshipping at the Mount of Olives. They were together. The early church was together. They were teaching. They were exhorting with all long suffering doctrine, just, just as Paul told Timothy to do. And so for us to have some idea of what God is okay with in our life, but no scriptural basis is just. Aaron. Verse 4 says that he went his way and he communed with the chief priests and captains of how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and they covenanted to give him money. Look, we'll give you this money. You, you, you're going you're gonna to turn him over. You're one of his own. You're going you're gonna to betray your leader to us. Yeah, we'll give you money. And he promised and he sought opportunity. He, he looked at how he could betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. He conspired. It wasn't just something that he, 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 he just thought of. He, he put a lot of thought into this. How can, I, how can I get this money? How can I turn Jesus over? I mean, I just wonder at any point in time, did, G, did Judas, obviously not because the devil had possessed him, but before the devil possessed him, I, I, I wonder at some point in time, did Jesus ever really touch his life? I would say, yeah. I mean, the, the, the people that he rose from the dead, the people that he healed, all the sick people, at some point, Judas had to have been like, wow, this is amazing. He's changing people's lives all over the place. I feel like my life has been affected. I feel so emotional. I feel like I've had these experiences with Jesus. But he hadn't experienced Jesus. And it says this in verse 7, Then there came the day of unleavened bread when Passover must be killed. It's so interesting, and I've shared this point before. This is a point that we've written down before, but I wanted to do it again. In your notes, number one is this. Christ is our Passover. The, the, the whole culmination of, uh, of, of the, the experience in the Word of God, you have to know this, points to Jesus Christ, a relationship with God. That's what God wanted from the very beginning. Take it back to the Garden of Eden. God walked with them in the cool of the day. He, he fellowshiped with them in the cool of the day. And when they weren't where they were supposed to be because sin had entered in, he asked them, Adam, hey, where are you at? He knew where Adam was. But sin had entered had severed, severed that fellowship, that relationship with God. That's what God still wants today. That's what he's wanted the whole time. And he used the nation of Israel. He used the word. He used the law. He used all of these things to point to Jesus, God, in the flesh, to point this out to us, that he so loved us. He so wanted to have a relationship with us that he would sacrifice his own life to have it. 
The only way that for us to have that relationship with God again. That's what the whole word of God is. So when the Passover was observed there in Egypt, and they had to put the blood on the doorpost, and they had to uh, have, have bread that was unleavened. They, didn't, they couldn't give time for it to rise because they had to get out speedily. God was going to deliver them instantly. When he said, this is what is going to happen, you're going to go, and this is how I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to deliver you from the hand of the, uh, from Pharaoh. And so that's what it was. This is the way that you are going to be delivered. You have to be behind the blood. You have to, you have to trust me. You have to believe me that you have to be behind the blood because if you don't trust me and you don't surrender your all to me and you don't do it as I said, you don't get behind the blood, then you will die. The death angel will not pass over you. He will come upon you. Jesus, thousands of years later, is the culmination of everything that God illustrated through Israel again and in the law. That's why Jesus said, don't think that I've come to get rid of the law, but I've come to fulfill it. I am the point of it all. He's our Passover. Verse 8, he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us Passover that we may eat. And he said unto them, uh, and they said unto him, where wilt thou prepare? We don't have, we don't have a hotel. We, we don't have a, a, a ministry house. <laughs> where are we going to have this, this, this meal? And he said, okay, look, go to this, uh, when you enter into the city, there's going to be a man meet you. And he's going to be having a, a pitcher of water. You know, follow him to where he goes. Isn't this kind of weird? I mean, in our day and time, we would think that's weird, right? Go to the city. You're going to see somebody carrying a pitcher of water and just follow him to his house. Right? I mean, I know if I'm like driving and somebody just starts following me, I'm going to start getting really suspicious. Amen? Amen? But then it gets better. And so go into the house and then tell the good man, look, the master said unto thee, where's your guest chamber? where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he's going to show you a large upper room furnace. There, make the, the meal ready. And they went, and look what happens. And found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. You know what's interesting about that? In our minds, we think, that's so weird. That's so crazy. We wouldn't do that today. I'm thinking, in, in, in Jewish culture, it was a little, it's, well, quite a bit different than what our culture is today. But still, it it, it wouldn't necessarily be the exact way that you would go about things, per se. But what he does is he tells them to do something, and they do it. And the Bible says it happened exactly how he said it would happen. It's the way that faith works. They could have said, look, this is weird, Jesus. (laughs) I I don't want to do that. I I, I don't want to walk behind somebody and then just walk into their house and tell them, look, we're going to have a meal here tonight. (laughs) Give us your upper room. Um, that's just awkward. We don't want to do that. They could have done that, but they said, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if they said okay like that, but they said, they said okay, we're, we'll do this. So they go and they, they do this. It happens exactly the way it's supposed to happen. Verse 14, when the hour was come, he sat down and 12 apostles with him and they said, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Which is such an interesting declaration that Jesus makes to them. And again, there's been different debates and thoughts about what Jesus was saying. Uh, you know, is this the marriage supper of the lamb he's talking about? What is, what is he talking about here? That he's not going to drink this, this vine, this juice, uh, until the kingdom of God is actually come. If you remember Jesus' teaching on a couple of things about the vine and the branches, he said this, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He also said that that we are to bear fruit. To bear much fruit is how how the Father is glorified. That's what he said, I believe, in John chapter 15. That us bearing much fruit is what brings God glory. He is the vine, we are the branches. It's from the vine that, that the, the branches get all of the nourishment. The fruit is, is produced off of that. All of it has to come from the vine. I believe that Jesus was saying his people, his church, his followers, that's the fruit that will be his, uh, his, his, his consummation, his consumption in his kingdom. I believe that according to the divine will of the Father, his church would be the fruit of the vine that he drank of in his kingdom. His true church. 
Verse 19, he took bread and, and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after, after saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant. Remember the old covenant? The old covenant is the, the, the law of Moses. It, it was with the blood of bulls and goats. And Hebrews tells us that they can never completely do away with sin. Blood, the blood of bulls and goats cannot completely do away with sin. That's why the high priest had to offer that, that sacrifice year after year. Jesus is the one sacrifice that was sufficient. So this is the new covenant that's established in my blood, and it's shed for you. Again, the juice representing the blood, the bread representing the flesh. What does this mean? What, what does that mean? Well, if you look in John chapter 6, it, it gets a little more interesting, which we've, we've preached this before, but look in verse 47. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's easy. That's, that's simple. When we, just like I said, while well, we surrender our life, we have eternal life. But look what he says next. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. They, they, eat, they ate bread, that, that physical bread that came down from heaven, and, and they died. Many died in the wilderness, the Bible says. But then he says, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven. He's talking about himself. That man may eat thereof and not die. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man of the, uh, eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, now you may not understand why this was such a perplexing thing, other than the fact that if you just take it in, in, in physical, literal terms, Jesus is saying you got to be a cannibal to have eternal life, right? That's what he's saying. My flesh is the bread that you got to eat in order to have eternal life. So that's odd. I mean, people sitting around thinking that that's a problem. I'm not eating your flesh. I, I, don't, I don't care how you cook it or how it's done. I'm not eating another person's flesh. That's not, that's not going to work for me. That was, that was one layer of the problem for the Jews. The other layer of the problem for the Jews was this, that they were forbidden in the Levitical law to eat, to, to be cannibals and to, to drink blood. They were for, they're forbidden to do this. And so for Jesus to say, look, you can't have life unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood posed a major problem for them, both personally and, you know, not, you know theologically, I guess. You gotta eat my flesh and drink my blood and say, look, they said, well, how are we going to do this? And Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, truly, truly. Again, he says, this is the truth. I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is a mind-blowing thing. He keeps driving home this point. Verse 54, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, and he shall, uh, even he shall live by me. This is th that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So this is such a weird teaching. <laughs> Eating flesh and drinking blood. This means that if you consume things that are of this earth only, just like manna, you will die indeed. And death will be your final sentence. But if you eat and consume the heavenly, that which was sent from above, Jesus Christ, this earthly, etern I mean, this heavenly, eternal provision, Jesus Christ, you will live. See, Jesus, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, is the Word made flesh, incarnate Word, and the Word dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Jesus is the incarnate Word. And so when we ingest spiritually, wholly ingest the Word of God, and we accept it, we trust it with everything that we have, we trust Him. We place our entire reliance and the substance of our being in Jesus Christ. That's when we receive life. And that's exactly what Jesus was teaching. And notice this, it's not just a nibble. He said, you've got to eat it. You've got to consume it. It's got to go inside of you. It's not just tasting. It's not just that. You say, why do you bring that up? Because Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 says this, that there are those who, the Bible talks about being apostates, that they have tasted of the heavenly gift. And it says that when they sin, it's impossible for them to renew them to repentance again. 
And the reason why is this, the same exact thing that we were talking about again in this, this meeting with this other pastor this last week, and, and, and it's this, it's so hard to get some people lost before they can be saved. Because some people think that they're saved already here. They're not saved. They have all the knowledge just like the demons. I know everything. I've heard the stories. I've been raised in church. But in their heart, there's not been a life surrender, an absolute consuming of Jesus, an absolute ingesting of him. You are my all type of faith. And that's why that they are able to be renewed to repentance. Because they didn't consume. They, they, didn't, they didn't wholly eat. They just tasted, just like Judas tasted of the heavenly gift. He saw the miracles. He saw all those things. But he didn't have Jesus in him. He, betray, he betrayed him. Verse 21, back in our text. But behold, the hand of him betrayeth me is on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto him uh, unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of, which of them it was that should do this thing. And then the disciples do something super spiritual and they begin arguing who's going to be the, the greatest in the kingdom of God. They, you know, here they are with Jesus. Jesus is about to leave. They're like, oh, wow, the kingdom of God's coming. I wonder who's going to be the best in the kingdom of God. Their minds, their hearts weren't right. We know that's not that they weren't. We're going to see in just a second. I'm going to try to wrap this up. But again, they argue over this. Christ says, look, the Gentiles, the kings of the Gentiles, they exercise lordship over them. And they have it all wrong. He said, it's the one that serves. Again, Christ was the one that was serving them in so many ways. His words, his life, and of course, his death to come. And he says this in verse 28, you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. So you continued with me through the hard times, and I've given you the instructions on how to do it when I leave. Point number two, Christ is our example to continue, come what may. Christ is our example to continue, come what may. No matter what comes against us, no matter what... Uh, uh, affliction, sickness, illness, a uh, problem on this earth on top of persecution for being Christians, struggles that, that we have to go through. Continue. Why continue following Jesus? Because continuing has eternal rewards. Continuing has eternal rewards. You say, I want God to bless me, then continue. I want God to, to, to use me, then continue. Verse 29, I appointed you a kingdom as my Father appointed unto me. Wow. That's an amazing blessing, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired, to, I'm sorry, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you and may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. When you come back, strengthen your brethren. He said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both into prison and to death. I'm not going to betray you. I'm not, not going to leave you. And he said unto thee, uh, I tell thee, Peter, the cock, shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny me that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, when, when I sent you with a purse and script and shoes, lacked you anything? He said, no, nothing. Then he said unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and, and likewise his script. He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoning, I'm sorry, he reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it's enough. And he came out and, his, and went, and as he went to the Mount of Olives, his disciples also followed him, and he was at the place. He said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to the disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And said unto them, Why sleep you? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That's exactly what he had been preparing for. It's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult. You're going to want to spiritually sleep and slumber, and you want to give in to the world. Don't do that. And right after he tells them these things, they fall asleep in, in their sorrow. And while he was yet speaking, behold, a multitude that was, uh, that was called Judas, and he, I'm sorry, he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they were about him, saw what would follow. They said unto him, Lord, shall we smite, smite with a sword? And one of them smote the servant, we know it was Peter, of the high priest, and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered, said, Suffer ye this far. 
which means no more of this. Don't, don't do this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come before him, he says, be ye come out as against the thief with swords and staves? Is that how I've threatened your lives? You're going to come at me with, with, with guns, with, with all these things, and, and this is how you're going to come. He says, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. I was there in your place. You could have taken me. So why are you coming out with swords and staves out here? But this is your hour in the power of darkness. This is your hour in the power of darkness. I want to ask our musicians to come. We'll have to finish this next week. And, uh, but I want to challenge you with this. Christ is our Passover. He's made the way. There's, we don't have to work for salvation. He, he is the sacrifice for our sins to give us this relationship with the Lord. To give us this, this, this fellowship with Almighty God and and again, my, my question to us this morning, as I asked earlier, is how are we living in anticipation for his return? I mean, are we truly living our lives for Jesus Christ? Is there a battle with, our, with allegiance in our life? Do I, do I serve myself? Do I serve my family? Do I serve my job? Do I serve my money, my possessions? Do I serve all these other things Sometimes with the competition of serving the Lord, or is it Christ above all, period? Because he is Lord of all, period. Because he is king of all, period. What does my life look like? Not just something I have in my mind that I think looks right in my life, but how is my life truly being lived? He's coming back. And the power of darkness, the, the hour of darkness is still now. The prince and the power of the air is Satan, and he is still ruling in this, this air and right now, this, this world right now. But his time is very short. And the Lord's turn, return is very quick, very soon. And if we as this church in the last days don't start getting serious about our commitment to his kingdom, we're going to miss it. We're going we're to miss this opportunity. We have so many things and so much stuff, so many blessings and so many resources. Are, are we really taking advantage for the kingdom of God or are these things consuming our lives? Man, let's dig in. Let's continue. Let's, let's be more committed than we've ever been before. I mean, we're celebrating the resurrection, the, the event that, that guaranteed our part of the resurrection. This event that is 100% telling us that we have life if we surrender to Jesus Christ. We're celebrating that. But what do our lives look like on a general basis? Remember, continuing has eternal rewards. Not just continuing when we feel like it, but continuing period. I'm a steadfast follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not like a Judas. I'm not even like a Peter. I'm a steadfast follower of Jesus Christ. Regardless of what comes against me, regardless of what comes up against us, I will continue to follow him because he gave his all for me. He is my Lord, my King, my all. Let's let that be our, our declaration. I will be a steadfast follower of Jesus Christ, come what may. And if you're here and you say, man, you were talking a while ago about surrender, and I have never done that before. I've prayed prayers. I've been in church before. I've been in church my whole life. I, I know all of the, I could tell somebody what Jesus did for them, but I have never surrendered control of my life to him. Because to this day, I still, I still do the things that I want to do versus being completely surrendered to him. And I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I have given my life to him. And as the course of my life goes on a daily basis, I want to do what pleases him. I want to obey his word. That's the desires of my heart. And along that path, I stumble and I fall and I mess up. I don't make deliberate plans and I don't make deliberate decisions to go against my Lord and to go against his will. I fall off sometimes and I mess up sometimes. But he has my life and he's directing my life. 
If, if, if that's not you, if you say, look, I, I just, I show up and do kind of whenever I want to, then I, I'm challenging you. I just don't see that in Scripture where that's true salvation. And I want to encourage you to come and talk to one of our ministers and, and, and see for sure if you know that heaven is going to be your home. It's not going to be your home unless you eat, consume holy, Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to come after I pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to be challenged in your word again. Over and over and over, I'm challenged. Over and over and over, I, I feel the need to press into you more, uh, to be more steadfast, to be more committed, to be more surrendered to you. And um, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the conviction and, and, and the instruction, the encouragement that you give me through your word. And I pray that all of us would have that together, that nobody who's truly your child this morning uh, would leave this place not more committed. Lord, I pray that every single one of your children would be more committed. They would realize how serious this end time is and, and, and for us to be continuing more and more to that final day. Lord, if there's someone here that's lost, they've never given their life to Jesus Christ, I pray they'd move this morning and do that in this invitation. We'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand this morning. As they sing just a couple verses this morning, I invite you to come.
Thank you all so much again for being here this morning. And uh, if you're a guest, I want to ask you to please come by the back so I can uh, meet you. I like to make sure to be able to uh, say hello. I don't get to talk to everybody, but uh, if you, again, if you're a guest, I'd like to, to meet you and uh, welcome you. And if you have any questions, again, please uh, go by the Welcome Center. And again, we got a gift for you if you're a first time visitor. Uh, don't forget, we do have service this evening and our prayer meeting, so I invite you back. Uh, tonight, and uh, don't forget your bulletin, everything in there, a lot of stuff going on, senior breakfast tomorrow, th something every night, I think, uh, this week, seems like, so, uh, y'all have a great afternoon, Brother Jeffrey, let's help me dismiss this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for this message, thank you for, uh, just your word, God, how it fills us up, and I pray that we would take it and we'd apply it to our lives, that we'd use uh, what we learned here today uh, for the furtherance of your kingdom, God. Bless now as we go. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Bring us back here at 530 uh, safely as well. We love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.